Well, welcome everyone. Brian, could I uh, ask you, Supervisor Culpa, to give us a, a quick word of welcome and, and if you'd like them to uh, recognize uh, Supervisor Eminger, and we'll get started. Well, I want to start off by thanking Supervisor Eminger and the town of Tonawanda for partnering with us in this project. Um, obviously, both uh, Supervisor Eminger and I care deeply about uh, the Niagara Falls Boulevard corridor and the uh, sort of joint future of that area. I don't think I need to tell anybody um, that's participating um, about the sort of somewhat recent series of events that have befallen the boulevard uh, from the 290 North. Uh, both uh, Supervisor Eminger and myself uh, were committed to changing some of the direction of that street. That's why we have the joint lighting project that you see. Um, and it's why we continue to push for uh, better outcomes for the communities that surround it. Uh, and, and I won't put words in his mouth, but I, I think that it's important to recognize that, you know, the Sweet Home School District spans both sides of the boulevard. Um, in many ways, this is a single community of users. Uh, and at the same time, it's two islands of, um, of, of developments. Um, both Tonawanda and, uh, and Amherst um, developments flanking the boulevard tend to be uh, geographically isolated by infrastructure. And our hope, or at least my hope, and, is that uh, we can work in ways to, uh, to, to add to the vitality of the community by, by bridging those divides uh, that are physically limiting um, and working towards both a better economic and communal future. And with that, I will uh, uh, turn it over to Supervisor Eminger. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, Supervisor Kalpa. Uh, yes, uh, there is uh, a common ground that we have uh, in between the town of Tonawanda and the town of Amherst, and that common ground uh, is more and more, more evident than Niagara Falls Boulevard. And uh, it faced, we face a lot of challenges with it over the last five years. Uh, since uh, Brian uh, has become supervisor in Amherst, uh, we've spent a lot of time, he and I, and our respective planning boards and other committees uh, discussing the, the, the challenges that the boulevard presents to us. Uh, we are neighbors uh, to each other, uh, but in some ways uh, we're, we're distant cousins because we, we do have uh, uh, a lot of dissimilarities as well uh, as some similarities. So uh, I wanna thank everyone for uh, joining us uh, on this uh, Zoom call uh, from both sides of the boulevard. Uh, uh, we need input from every side uh, of the boulevard uh, from uh, those, you know it, uh, in some ways a lot better than uh, Supervisor Koppel or myself because you live right in that neighborhood and uh, 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 Brian and I don't. So uh, we, we look forward to getting uh, going on this, uh, uh, this study and I'm anxious to hear what, uh, what is going to be presented tonight and what we're going to hear from the public. So uh, Vic, there, I'll turn it back to you or whoever's going to run it from here and you can off and run it. Well, I'll get us started and then I'm going to turn it over to Amy Groves momentarily. Good evening again, everyone. Victor Dover. Uh, I'm a town planner and urban designer with the firm of Dover Cole and Partners. Um, I, um, and Brian, before we get started with the agenda, is there anyone else you'd like to recognize uh, in attendance from your elected officials so I, I, or other dignitaries? I, I apologize if I'm missing any of my board members. I know Councilwoman Deborah Buckeye is on. Um, I saw her name there. So, uh, Councilwoman, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Councilwoman. Well, tonight's uh, agenda is pretty simple. This is a kickoff. So we're going to have a chance in just a few weeks in April uh, to sit and work together over maps in person, uh, live in-person gatherings. And we'll uh, also, of course, have continued opportunities for participating online. We want to cover tonight the purpose of this plan, what it, what it includes, We'll talk about the uh, schedule for upcoming events, in particular the charrette, which is the uh, week-long uh, intensive workshop uh, with, with multiple opportunities for you to plug in and participate. Uh, we'll give you a little food for thought because we know between now and the beginning of April, you're going to be looking at the boulevard differently after tonight's presentation and getting ready for those uh, events. So we'll give you a little bit of uh, food for thought, things we always think about when we begin a project of this type and some best practices which might or might not apply. Uh, then we're gonna just turn and, and ask what's on your mind. You'll use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type in 
uh, messages. And as we go along the way through this agenda, we'll be pausing to poll you using your smartphone uh, with some key questions. Um, well, who's here? By way of introductions, as I mentioned earlier, this is a joint effort of the two towns, Amherst and Tonawanda. Our firm, Dover Colon Partners, is leading the effort from the consultant team side with, um, you know, as the town planners and urban designers, but we also have um, crack uh, transportation planners and engineers, uh, economists, and folks who are located in Western New York who are specializing in community outreach and public participation. So you'll be meeting some of them and hearing from some of them as we go along in, the, uh, in tonight's events. I'll give you a little introduction, just who we are. Um, yeah, Amy and I like to say we have the best job we can imagine having because we get to help communities decide what they want to be when they grow up. Uh, knowing that, that every community worthy of the name is always changing, always evolving. And, uh, and people have to shape their plans so that they get the place that they want. And we, in our work, uh, move back and forth between working for uh, small local governments or medium-sized ones or big cities, working for private investors and developers in some cases, not in the same place we're working for the city like we are here, and working on corridors or zoning or um, uh, all the different kind of historic preservation, regional planning, all those sorts of things. So. Our job is to think at multiple scales. Um, our job is also to help you visualize change before it occurs. So we'll make a lot of pictures. We work in a very visual way to help people imagine how lost space in their community might or might not be recaptured uh, and imagined, uh, repurposed in new ways. The idea behind that is that growth and change are probably inevitable, but if you're smart about it and you lead the way, growth and change can make things a lot better rather than worse. So incrementally, step by step, we visualize how to help you evolve the place you know into the place you'd rather have while along the way, preserving what you consider most important. Um, but in many communities around our country, um, the need is there to get really specific so that developers come build the place that you want or investors are making improvements, small or large, that contribute to being more like the place you want the town to be. Um, you will discover as you get to know me, I'm a little obsessed with street design. I, I co-wrote this big fat book about it, which is uh, a proud to say leading textbook in the subject. Um, but I don't want you to go buy a copy of it. I really want you to go buy 500 copies of it and pass it out to all of your friends. Um, the, anyway, what we have discovered is that you can't really just think about the real estate or about the park or about the parking. You have to think about the spaces between buildings. Um, like uh, streets and that's where community comes together. So we're gonna be bringing up street space and public space uh, as we talk to you about uh, this whole subject. Maybe you wanna go to the next one. Um, for those who don't know, we've been busy over the last several years helping the town of Amherst on uh, some strategic uh, sites. For example, uh, we helped depict ways uh, the failing Boulevard Mall could be transformed over time into something that was uh, a more robust and thorough use of the land, but all, and more valuable for the town, but also more like a place where people wanna be. So that's an example of this kind of before and after thinking that I've been describing, where we start with a mental picture of the place that's there and then help you visualize alternatives about ways that can be changed gradually and uh, or quickly into the place that you really want it to be. Every little decision along the way matters, like zoning or transportation, infrastructure, how you design your streets, including your most important streets like Niagara Falls Boulevard. Uh, so change over time is the theme there. And so let's shift to what's gonna be happening over the next few weeks. The, uh, uh, I'll ask Amy to come up and talk about the, the purpose of the plan as documented in the charter for this effort that the two towns set out and give you a rundown on events in the coming weeks. Hi, good evening. I'm Amy Groves with Dover Coal. And as Victor mentioned, there is a charter that the towns of Amherst and Tonawanda have put together that outlines their goals for this project. Uh, the, the goal is to work together in a coordinated way, addressing problems and opportunities to improve connectivity, recreation, 
building conditions and pedestrian safety um, along the boulevard and within the neighborhoods. So we're gonna be looking at uh, the study area you see outlined here. Uh, the area basically extends along the boulevard from I-290 um, north to the county line, uh, includes uh, the Parkview Triangle neighborhood and the Willow Ridge neighborhoods, as well as Ellicott Creek Park. Um, so the purpose of this study is to work together with the community and address land use and zoning, economic revitalization, uh, transportation and community amenities and services in the area. And how are we going to do that? We are going to be hosting what Victor mentioned, a charrette in the next few weeks. So charrettes are like old fashioned barn raising events where neighbors come together for a short period of time and work together towards a common goal. Uh, and so the charrettes will have a variety of ways to get involved um, from large group meetings to small focus groups and one on one conversations. Um, the the shred for this project is going to be April 2nd through the 7th. Uh, and the overall goal is just shortening the feedback loops. So um, identifying points of consensus by gathering input from a large variety of participants over a condensed period of time and um, circling back and doing drawings and uh, showing and asking, is this what you meant? Uh, the opportunities, there'll be opportunities to share ideas in person, um, to come to virtual meetings like this one, uh, and also to share ideas online. So I'm going to take a few minutes now just to walk through um, what we've got planned uh, over those weeks. Um, and uh, the, these events are also summarized on the website. So if you miss anything of what I'm saying, you can go there to get um, some additional information. But uh, we're going to start on Saturday, April 2nd at a morning hands-on session. So at this meeting, we're going to roll out base maps and brainstorm with community participants about what they would like to see uh, in the future of the study area. So this event's going to be at the, the Norman Virgil Community Center at Sweet Home High School uh, in the morning of April 2nd. Then on Sunday, we're going to take a bus tour. So we're going to um, tour around the area. You can join for some or all of this, uh, where we're going to be looking at the existing conditions together, talking about things that the community likes, and, and talking about things that could be improved in the future. On Monday night, April 4th, we're going to have a second community hands-on design session, but this time we're going to meet over Zoom. So we'll have a similar exercise to what we do on Saturday morning, but this time using Google Maps and uh, talking like this, just giving you know another opportunity for people to um, join us and share their ideas. And then during the week, our team of planners, engineers, uh, illustrators, and economists will be working at a temporary design studio, summarizing all the ideas we've heard and testing ideas on key sites. So community is welcome to drop in uh, and see the work underway. We're gonna be there from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Wednesday. Uh, we're also planning to stay late on Tuesday night. So if you can't make it during those hours, uh, we'll be there uh, late Tuesday night um, until 8.30 to you wanna drop in and see what we've got going on. Uh, at the end of the week, we're going to present everything we've heard so far at what we call the work in progress presentation. So this meeting we're going to hold by Zoom. Um, we're going to be asking questions to see if you think the work so far is on the right track um, and, uh, and show everything that we have. If you're not able to attend that night, uh, we're going to also make the recording available so you can catch up later when you have time. Uh, I mentioned the website. Um, if for anyone who hasn't uh, heard about it yet, there is a, a new website, correct? ConnectingWRPV.com. Uh, we'll be posting project information, meeting recordings, um, and conducting surveys here. Um, the website just went live last week, um, and we're going to have a survey uh, uh, shortly after this meeting uh, based on what we discuss at this meeting and the time leading up to the charrette. So when you go to the homepage, you can scroll down and you'll see um, there's buttons where you can click to um, find out more about all the charrette events and also uh, to take the survey. So when you have time, please um, uh, go to uh, connectingwrpv.com and uh, check it out. Uh, but now we're gonna take some time to find, ask a few questions to find, about who, find out about who we have with us in the meeting tonight. So um, as Victor mentioned, we're gonna do this um, using um, text messaging. So if everyone uh, wants to get out their phone, uh, the way that we do this is that you send a text message to the number 22333, uh, and the message that you send is Dover Cole 516. So it's, it's all one word. You can do uppercase or lowercase. Um, I'll give you all a minute to, to get that done. Again, you send to the number 22333, uh, the message Dover Cole 516. Uh, and if you're successful, you're gonna get a, a confirmation message like this. So I'll give everyone just a few minutes. Um, hopefully, um, some of you were able to get logged in. You said to do this once, and then you're going to just be able to text the answers to any, all the questions that we're asking uh, directly. So uh, just log in once. 
um, and then send your answers. So these, this, these instructions will stay at the top of the slide if you didn't get that number, if you're still digging around for your phone. Uh, but I'm gonna ask Elise, I'm gonna stop sharing. If you wanna start sharing from your end, we'll bring up the first set of questions. Awesome. Okay, so you should be seeing the first question now. Um, the first question is, what is your primary interest in the area? So for this, you'll type in either A, B, or C, or D into your text. That's all you have to write. Um, A is, I live in the area. B, I work or own a business in the area. C, I don't live, work, or own a business here, but I travel on Niagara Falls Boulevard frequently. Or D, other. And it does take a second for your answer to come in. So if it doesn't pop up immediately, just give it a couple seconds. Awesome. Also, if you still need the number, it's right here at the top of the screen. So you'll just text over Cole 516 to 22333. Okay, awesome, looking good. So it looks like we're still getting a few more answers, so I'm gonna give it a little bit more time. And like Amy said, you don't have to um, log in again. So now you're in for the whole session and you can just type in your answers whenever we do polling. Okay, looks good. So I think I'm gonna to go to the next question. Okay, so the second question is, how long have you lived, worked, or owned a business in the area? A, less than two years, B, two to five years, C, six to 10 years, D, longer than 10 years, E, I don't live, work, or own a business in the area. So we'll go ahead and give it a couple minutes so people can get their answers in. I do want to mention if you hit the wrong answer, you are able to change your answer. Um, you can just try typing another answer and it'll actually give you instructions. What, what you really have to do is you type undo uh, and then you hit the answer that you want. So um, don't worry if you um, hit the wrong answer the first time. You know, I couldn't help noticing that in tonight's audience, which is you know, 61 self-selected volunteers who heard about this event and are giving up their evening to, to join us for the kickoff. 69% live in the area, 9% uh, work or own a business in the area. So that tells you that um, we probably are have a uh, relatively light representation of business and property owners along Niagara Falls Boulevard. Um, if I had to guess, that's what that indicates. So I always think this is useful for everybody to see so that you have the chance to step out of your usual role and your usual hat and think on behalf of people you know would be interested in this but are not in the room. Maybe they are in a different age group or they're busy um, or they're, uh, we see that there's a light turnout. So of course, the goal here is a plan of the balance public interest for all folks and um, as we go through more events in the coming weeks, you might reach out to your friends and uh, maybe people who are not exactly like you, not a house just like yours or an apartment like yours, but rather uh, the person who makes your coffee or who uh, owns a business that you frequent and tell them to participate as well. Perfect, so I'm gonna go ahead to the next question because it looks like we're done getting some answers. Okay, so this one is, if you live in the area, which neighborhood do you call home? A, Parkview, B, Willow Ridge, C, I live in the general area, but outside of these neighborhoods, or D, I don't live in the area. Supervisors, this looks like a very tight race between the two towns in terms of the participation from both sides of the boulevard. I'm delighted to see it balanced in this way.
Awesome. Okay, so I'll give it just a little bit more time and then we'll move on. Okay, so the next question is a little bit different. Um, so this one, you're actually going to send in one word. What is one word that describes the study area today? So Niagara Falls Boulevard or your neighborhood, just one word that you can think of to describe the area. And the bigger the word gets is the more people that have submitted that word. It's always interesting to see the answers coming in. It looks like busy is um, the most popular so far, but um, it, this is a really interesting exercise just to see um, limiting it to one word, what, what people come up with. I like hopeful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so it looks like everyone's gotten in their answers. It looks like busy is um, the biggest one here. So the most people submitted that. Um, so the next question is going to be one word that describes the study area in the future. So your vision, what do you see this area being? One word. My suggestion here is don't just give your forecast about what you think is going to happen. Uh, in the absence of planning, but instead give your preference for your vision of what should happen in the presence of planning as a result. A lot of happier words here. I like safe. I think that's very positive. I noticed busy gave birth to busier in uh, in between these two slides. Yeah, this is this is an interesting exercise for us to just get an idea of what's on your minds. And we may do this once or twice more with uh, different questions over the next few weeks. So if you think of something you wish you had typed, don't worry, you'll get another chance. Okay, it looks like um, everyone's gotten in their answers. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and Amy's gonna take over again. Okay, so now we're gonna take a, uh, spend a few minutes just taking a closer look at the area and um, what we've started observing uh, over the past month. So our team was out in Amherst earlier this month. Uh, you may have seen us out taking pictures. We were getting familiar with the area. We all, we've also started creating analysis maps and studying the, the unique characteristics of the area. Uh, so we looked at the conditions along Niagara Falls Boulevard, noting the crosswalks and the sidewalks and what it felt like to walk and drive along the corridor. Uh, we spent some time specifically at the Ellicott Creek Bridge, looking at pedestrian conditions there along the sidewalk and thinking about how trail connections uh, in the area could be improved. Uh, we toured the Rilla Ridge neighborhood, noting the tree-lined streets, the elementary school and the park, the apartment areas to the south, connections across 990 to the university and the Ellicott Creek to the north. Uh, we also toured Parkview Triangle, um, looked at how the commercial uses on the boulevard transitioned uh, to the neighborhood homes and looking at connections to Ellicott Creek Park. Um, we also toured the area north of the creek um, where the scale of commercial development gets a little bigger and looking along um, old Niagara Falls Boulevard, noting the bike trail, uh, the water view and potential for a mix of land uses here. Uh, we've also been studying a lot of the background um, planning documents. There's been a lot of great planning that's been done for this area already. And so our goal is to work with and work build upon what's already been completed. Um, so our team's been getting up to speed of this and we're gonna be meeting with the experts that put these studies together um, during our site visit and during the charrette. So here's just a sampling of, of some of those things um, that uh, many of you may 
be um, some of the experts on. Uh, for example, uh, the, the local waterfront revitalization plan uh, that's underway, um, which addresses Ellicott Creek and Tonawanda Creek areas, uh, the town's comprehensive plan, uh, and the parks and recreation master plan. So each of these has things that are um, uh, relevant to this study. So for example, in the, the parks and, and recreation plan, it outlines the uh, existing and potential future trail network uh, in the area. We've been looking at the draft of the LWRP that identifies projects in the area, um, for example, connecting missing segments of the Empire State Trail uh, along the northern part of the study area uh, and streetscape improvements for Old Niagara Falls Boulevard. Uh, we've also looked at ideas for connecting the, the Ellicott Creek Trailway across Niagara Falls Boulevard near the bridge, um, how to make the, the boulevard more pedestrian and bike friendly, um, and the kayak launch on Ellicott Creek. Uh, in 2019, the town passed a mixed use zoning code. So this code gives direction for how auto oriented areas can be retrofit to accommodate walkable and pedestrian oriented mixed use areas. And there are standards in there for um, what are called centers, which are um, larger areas as well as um, more shallow commercial corridors. Um, and there's a variety of frontage types that could be applied based on what the vision is for the area. So for example, if you're in a village core, um, you can follow standards for more continuous buildings that are close to the sidewalk or um, on an arterial, you can follow frontage standards where buildings may be set back a little bit from the sidewalk with um, a little bit more, more gaps between buildings. Uh, so similarly, the town of Tonawanda has a number of plans that we're becoming familiar with, um, including the, the Niagara Falls Boulevard safety audit that they did together with the town of Amherst, as well as a recent economic action plan uh, and a complete streets policy. Uh, they're similarly working on updates to their zoning, um, envisioning a mix of uses along the Niagara Falls Boulevard in this uh, progress draft that's underway. Uh, the Complete Street Network um, is, looks at improving options to walk and bike throughout the town. Um, relevant to this study, there's a proposed bikeway along the utility line that's south of the Parkview Triangle neighborhood. Um, so we thought that was interesting uh, connection. And we've also been looking at uh, the, um, oops, skipped a slide. <laughs> uh, we've been looking at with the rails to trails connections, um, how the town has been addressing how these trails cross the major arterials and looking at this recently installed Hawk signal on Sheridan Drive. So we think it's an interesting example um, to be thinking about for Niagara Falls Boulevard. Um, there are a number of regional plans relevant to the area as well. Uh, the Greater Buffalo Niagara Ni Buffalo Niagara Regional Transportation Council uh, re recently released a regional bike plan that coordinates existing and planned on and off road trails in the region, uh, which will, and uh, also Erie County has updated its parks master plan, which will guide improvement, improvements to Ellicott Creek. Uh, the One Region Forward effort was a um, centerpiece of the University of Buffalo sustainability planning endeavors. Um, and uh, it was a three-year effort uh, guiding sustainable planning, development, land use, and transportation. Uh, there's a number of efforts in the area that have been building off of this, including the, um, the Moving Forward 2050 effort of the Regional Transportation Council, which is a regional plan to prioritize and, and guide the region's transportation system. And this can apply to the boulevard. Uh, we thought these maps were really interesting. That was in the Erie County framework for regional growth. Um, and they document how the region has developed over time. And if you look closely, you can see a, a short yellow line in, on each map that we drew. And it's the approximate location of um, the Niagara Falls Boulevard segment of our study area. And you can look at how the area has changed over time from a rural area to a developing rural area in the 1950s and 60s. Um, to a fully developed area uh, in the 2000s. And so, you know, thinking about the time when development first occurred in this area, the automobile was the dominant mode of moving around. Um, this image shows the boulevard in 1951, just south of our study area. This is um, Sheridan Drive, stretching from Sheridan Drive to Ridgely. Uh, but you can see that what the, you know, the form of development looked like in the 50s and looking at ads for the area that advertised free parking for hundreds of cars. And this was, what was you know the what was the impetus for development in, in the area? But you know years of development later um, in this auto oriented fashion has left the community with a road that's become dangerous for pedestrians and cyclists. And uh, this issue is one of the primary reasons you know as we've been talking about that started this project, improving safety along 
corridor. And, you know, we couldn't help but see the headlines in recent years that emphasize how important this um, really is to this effort. And the towns have already started working together to look at the problems and identify solutions. And we're gonna be building off of this work. Uh, in 2018, they completed a pedestrian road safety audit. And the road is owned and assigned to DOT, but the towns are responsible for the land uses and zoning, sidewalks and street lighting along the corridor. And so um, here's a picture of um, some of the analysis that's in this document. It identifies things like gaps in area sidewalks or where snow storage interrupts pedestrian access. Uh, in general, the team found that pedestrians have to walk too far to get to intersections with signals and crosswalks and wait too long to cross when they get there. And for even those that you do use the crosswalks, the signals don't give them enough time to safely cross. So, um, you know, all of this information summarized, um, you know, a number of concerns as well as near and long-term considerations. And some of these things, you know, you'll notice the towns have already started, like uh, the street lights along the corridor. And so during this process, we can evaluate potential for, you know, additional considerations like adding street trees or installing hawk signals or encouraging pedestrian friendly developments. This is just a great resource for us all to work from. Uh, in 2019, the, DO, the Department of Transportation also did a, a pedestrian safety corridor evaluation. And so it documents the existing conditions, um, the posted speed limits, and the average annual daily traffic along the corridor. It also looked at when pedestrian crosses were occurring, um, but based on these graphs, often in the winter and after the sun had, had gone down. The study identifies a number of potential improvements, lighting, signage, um, pedestrian signals. Um, it also looks at changes to the road design, which we thought were interesting. Some of these recommendations like this um, concept for reducing the number of lanes near the Willow Ridge Drive intersection um, to narrow the crossing width. Um, and this idea for a road diet that shows um, how one or two lanes could be repurposed for other uses like wider sidewalks and bike facilities. Now, this specific example is drawn for the area south of 290, but a similar idea could be looked at for the area, uh, the seven lane area north of 290. So all of that to say, these um, large auto-oriented corridors um, are not a challenge unique to Amherst and many communities across the country are dealing with them and contemplating solutions to make safer and more livable neighborhoods. And I'm gonna turn it over to Victor to give a little bit of food for thought and um, ideas from other places. Well, Amy, I'm gonna jump right in because I know you just pressed Supervisor Culpa's favorite button, which is to talk about the pedestrian danger issues on Niagara Falls Boulevard. Uh, we're going to come to street design again in a minute. I, I thought it might be useful to, uh, before you start, to sit with us and look over maps and mark things and imagine what could be, um, to uh, zoom out a little and talk about some best practices and things to keep in mind as you start to get uh, worried about whether something is possible or wondering if, there's, if you can give yourself permission to have that idea. Uh, first of all, communities get the towns they deserve they get the towns they plan for not uh from they don't get their great livable neighborhood from the easter bunny or santa claus or somebody you get it because you get together like we're doing here drawing lines on a map and imagining what could be and that's a very long tradition in america um you know from well before colonial times and, and through colonial times up until the 1940s especially it was typical for communities to do the efforts of the kind that your towns uh, are convening here. In fact, the, the, the plan for Washington DC that was the product of not just Pierre L'Enfant and Benjamin Banneker, but also Andrew Ellicott, a name that should be familiar to you all, um, was really more than a land use plan with zoning colors on it for commercial and residential. It was a physical form plan for how the land meets the water, what kind of special public spaces could be created, how things go together in a network or ensemble. Um, the urban form was part of this planning tradition. And you're participating in that tradition by coming to meetings like this one and the ones we'll have in April. So I'm going to kind of touch on a few subjects here very briefly uh, that you can be thinking about between now and, and our meeting in a couple of weeks. First, uh, street design, it can seem really daunting to think about uh, how to make great streets out of a big, fat, ugly street like Niagara Falls Boulevard. Uh, but I can't help but think it can be a great street if you take the time to think how to do it and work together to implement it. Um, so we'll talk about some precedents for that. Next, uh, we'll shift our lens to the 
smaller local neighborhood streets and what kinds of things can be improved there that won't just make safety go up, but that's certainly a big part of it, but also make curb appeal go up for people who are looking for a neighborhood uh, where they can invest and make their home um, like you have. And I will briefly touch on special considerations of planning for uh, bike connectivity and trails, since we know that's a big subject, as Amy just uh, outlined for us. And then uh, my final thought for you will be about parks. So let's just blast through those ideas very, very quickly. First, before and after thinking, I called it before. The big takeaway is if you visualize it, you can ask for it, you can negotiate for it, you can get in line for funding for it. Visualizing is everything. So if we can get a good story going visually about how much better the boulevard could be, like they did here in Beaufort, South Carolina, you can get in line and you can even move to the front of the line for funding, which is exactly what happened in Beaufort, South Carolina. They have a Niagara Falls Boulevard-like road called Boundary Street. Um, and when they first started drawing as an ambitious community effort, they didn't know how, they eventually pay for the improvements. Now those improvements are implemented and funded just a few short years later. And because they had shovel-ready drawings, they had an illustration of what they were trying to build, uh, they secured major funding when that became available. So without a plan, you can't get that. Next idea, I think for these corridors is to remember that they're kind of long and they vary along their lengths. They can be mentally divided into different segments laid end to end. And in each of those segments, you can have a different solution. You don't necessarily have to have one perfect cross section or only one idea of what it's supposed to look like and then extrude that idea along the whole corridor. You can actually to say, no, you know, this intersection is different or this crossing at the bridge and the trail is different, and I will need a different design solution for that area. Um, or this, this location for small and local businesses is too important to, uh, to leave it as it is, but the solution for how to solve that is different from another part, which is more suburban or green. And that's, a, that's an idea that we've used on previous projects. Well, the one that Amy showed you the map of is called the Capital Corridor in uh, the greater Lansing area, which actually stretches between multiple jurisdictions, just like this two town effort we're doing here. And they got together and visualized how they could might, might modify the street that was hard to cross and missing crosswalks. Um, you know, in the beginning, the, the first illustrations were just how to strategically fill in the lost space with um, as parking gradually moved to the back and the side and the mid middle of the block and on street. And then how to make subtle improvements to the widths of the sidewalks, the visibility of the crosswalks. And then they took another look at it um, to see how they might make it even better if they didn't need as many lanes. And so that requires some hard conversations about how transit works, um, you know, uh, the through going trips that are headed way up north versus the very local trips that are circulating around close to your homes. So we'll try to use the same visual kind of before and after thinking um, for the commercial corridor at the center of this effort. Grand River Avenue, which is the, this, the centerpiece of the Capitol Corridor, has some places where the buildings are pretty tight and the lots are shallow, and in other places where the lots are deep, the buildings are set back behind bigger parking lots. And as we've gotten to know Niagara Falls Boulevard, we realize you also have both conditions. But here's one where there's a whole lot of space um, you know, that lies uh, out beyond the right-of-way. And that, were, that led to an ambitious uh, vision for retrofit. And you want to go on to the after picture? Might be getting a little zoom lag there. There you go. Uh, basically, it, it's visualizing that uh, with a new generation of prosperity and growth and change and swapping out older formats and replacing them with new ones, a natural process, uh, in cities, you could gradually piece back together a corridor that felt more like a place and a great address, uh, and even tree lined. Now, as you step aside from or step a wider lens from just the uh, commercial corridors and think about the neighborhoods as a whole, I think we're living in a very interesting time in which neighborhoods like yours um, are enjoying a, a kind of revival of interest. They're, you're not downtown uh, in the center of historic Buffalo, 
Um, you're not in the center of historic Williamston, but uh, you're in that first ring. And there's this immense uh, business interest these days in finding new purposes and offering a higher quality of life um, that we're hearing from the uh, from the business community, from property owners and developers, people like that, bankers. It matches up with what we're hearing from consumers. I don't know, there are many times we hear from um, neighbors and local communities about how they'd like it to be more uh, intimate, more walkable, more friendly, more convenient, and maybe even a place where they wouldn't have to drive everywhere for everything, every time. So we're going to be asking, does that apply here? Is that relevant? Um, for what it's worth, this cartoon is not from an environmental magazine or something that's from the Wall Street Journal. And I guess the point there is that um, if, you've, if you've wondered why we don't have more livable communities uh, in North America as a citizen, uh, trust me, the business folks are wondering that too. And they're trying to figure out how to bring it to you. If only we can get the rules right. Um, in that first ring of uh, suburbs, the, the historical streetcar suburbs that radiate out around our city centers, there are lots of uh, places where lost space is being recaptured. Here's one outside Midtown Atlanta where uh, strategic infill development, very, highly varied development with a little bit of everything, houses, housing, attached houses, detached houses, office buildings, uh, live work units like the ones in the background of this picture were fit into one of those uh, big blank spots in their canvas. And so, you know, this approach, mixing things up, interconnecting the streets, uh, building new neighborhoods or out of old or making modifications to uh, aging neighborhoods so that they have that kind of connectedness. Uh, you're not alone if you've wondered about that. In fact, folks right there in your region have been thinking about it. Some of our recent work for Buffalo included this um, uh, idea on the Sheridan corridor. On one side of the street, you see um, the deeper lots and a vision for uh, how some of those properties might be reused or, uh, or more fully used as the older shopping centers uh, gray out or age out. And then on the foreground, on the lower left, you see shallower lots like our common uh, on say the west side of the boulevard on the Tunnel One side. So um, I guess I, I, I think we're coming at this question about the future of the boulevard and the neighborhoods that, that back up to it uh, at a time when a similar question is being asked about many corridors around your region. Now, Amy mentioned this, uh, this change to the zoning in the town of Amherst that was adopted a couple of years ago. This is a really big deal. That chapter on mixed use districts uh, actually gets at the street design subject, not just the land uses or the building designs, and specifying those components, the number of lanes, the width of the lanes, and the, the position of street trees, things like that. Uh, so that we might think of these corridors as more than just ways of getting back and forth in our cars, but ways to also walk or use transit or good addresses for business uh, and for living. As you talked about the local neighborhood streets, I couldn't resist adding my a favorite picture of Chautauqua, not far from you. Um, but the you know the narrow streets and the and interconnected but skinny uh, in that great old neighborhood um, are kind of instructive because they're very slow. There are driving and people are driving. There there are cars fewer than maybe in many in, in many other places. But the owners in Chautauqua are allowed to bring their cars in. Um, but it's all happening in the neighborhood's terms, very slow, and slow is safe. And uh, so here we have a couple of senior citizens who are tooling around on their bikes and not feeling at all imperiled uh, by the fact that they're sharing space with cars. So getting the size right and the speed down is really important for that. Um, this is the only science slide I'll show you, but a little bit of uh, high school physics. When there's a collision, a crash, but we don't call them accidents anymore because if you design your street in a dangerous way, which arguably has happened uh, over the last 50 years on Niagara Falls Boulevard, they really can't be called accidents. People knew it was dangerous, but we call them collisions. And when there's a collision between a motorist uh, and a pedestrian, if, the, if that happens when the car is going slow, then uh, 
there's a lot less mayhem. For example, at 20 miles per hour, you know, 5% of the time, one time out of 20, still too many, there will be a fatality when that happens. But if you, the chart shows what happens when just a little increase in speed occurs, when say that car is moving at 30 miles an hour instead of 20, um, now that collision is gonna result in a fatality over half the time. Um, and then you know, at 40, over 80% of the time. So what does this tell you? It tells you that just a little extra speed um, on a little extra pressure on your gas pedal actually changes the likelihood of, uh, of death and injury dramatically. And, and, and for all of us with modern quiet uh, cars, it doesn't take much to speed up 20 to 30 to 40. We think nothing of it, especially if the corridor invites us to do that by its own design. Uh, but the truth is when, the, when things go wrong, they go a lot more badly wrong when people are driving fast. So the best thing we can do is bring speeds down. Now, that doesn't mean just changing the posted speed, you know, the speed limit. It means designing the street so that it feels natural to drive more slowly. Um, the changing the sign by itself and trying to increase enforcement by itself will not result in more safety, but redesign will. Now, design is also uh, on our minds when we're thinking about trails and, and off-road, um, non-motorized ways of moving around for people on foot and people on bikes, you know, runners and walkers and, and cyclists all uh, share multi-user trails, for example. And I put these slides here because they're all different. And those important parks visioning processes that have been going on in your towns um, about the, the, tra the trailway, for example, and how to connect it across the boulevard. Um, I guess the lesson for us is that these corridors all are allowed to vary just like streets and just like neighborhoods. They are not all the same, it can be many different ways of doing it, but they can add a lot to quality of life and value. So we're gonna be looking at trails closely. Um, for those who follow such things, I know we have some folks um, from the business world and um, realtors representing home buyers and home sellers on our call tonight. Um, the research that comes out every couple of years from the National Association of Realtors tells us about the most important factors that affect people's decisions about where to live. And you might just look at this and glance at it and ask, are, were you any of these? Years ago, 20 years ago, probably at the top of the list would have been uh, schools. And as the nation has aged and our household formations have changed, so we're not creating as many of those uh, uh, traditional, you know, I love Lucy type uh, or Aussie and area, leave it to beaver families as we might have once been creating. Schools have dropped out of the list. So out of a list of maybe 70 or 80 things people could identify as their most important factors, the things that today are rising to the top are on this list. And there are things like being able to walk around and having somewhere to go when you go out for a walk on foot and having the other things close by uh, like parks and shops. Uh, people still value easy access to the highway. And interestingly enough, your neighborhood has that, which is, I think is uh, your neighborhoods have that, which is uh, very interesting. And then um, we noticed that lately separated bike paths and, tra and trails have, have been moving higher and higher in this list that made it onto the slide of the top seven things. Let's examine why that might be. Um, so the last thing about trails, that second bullet probably says it all. The National Association of Home Builders now tells us that the number one amenity people seek when they're looking for a house is trails. Um, it's more important to them than pools or tennis courts or acreage of parks or other things. Um, it seems to really be important. And then that last bullet tells you, other than the last couple, that it's beneficial to existing homeowners when trails get completed in their immediate neighborhoods. Um, not on this slide is the dramatic public health benefit. Uh, if you live within half a mile of a class one bikeway, you're 15% more likely to get your, re your recommended daily exercise. 15%, that may not sound like very much. It's huge because public health folks who are worried about the epidemics of obesity and, or, and childhood obesity, early onset diabetes, and hypertension, and heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, they are all know that a 15% improvement in people getting recommended daily exercise 
is worth trillions in our nation uh, in saved healthcare, healthcare costs. So that's why making it easy to cross big roads is a part of making trails work. So Amy, show them a before and after here from the West Ashley Greenway in South Carolina. There's actually a greenway coming right up to that road uh, in much the same way that the trailway is making its way toward your boulevard, but not quite getting across it. Um, but they've uh, been looking at this kind of high visibility crosswalk implemented tool uh, to make it look like you're supposed to be there. And I think that's that I was reminded of this uh, when we saw what the uh, town of Tonawanda has recently done over on Sheridan. So if you want people to use, to use their bikes or walk, you have to give them uh, places that look like they're supposed to do that. In any plan, <clears throat> my advice to our, our team, uh, my admonition to Amy and Lisa and all of us is to always start with the green parts. And um, we know that that is the right best practice approach because we see it on display in Greater Buffalo. Uh, and Frederick Law Olmsted, the father of landscape architecture in America, uh, the designer of Prospect Park in Brooklyn or Central Park in Manhattan, also the designer of the whole park system um, in um, Buffalo and the Great Parkways, the Lincoln Parkway and others. Uh, he taught us that if we want to make truly livable cities uh, where we're in sync with nature and and coming to our full potential as human beings, we need great parks. And so starting the green parks is a uh, green parts of a plan is a approach we'll bring to this. Um, and it's actually one of the things we're excited about because um, your existing park systems are, are remarkable and, and uh, Ellicott Creek Park in particular and cry out to be better connected to their surroundings. But we've been looking closely at the updates to recent parks plans like the one that Amy mentioned for Ellicott Creek Park. And I, I just want you to know that we're aware of them and we are eager to help you uh, figure out how best to connect to them, implement them, adjust to them, and make them beneficial to, uh, to yourselves in, in Parkview and uh, in uh, Willow Ridge. So with that, I'll turn it back to Amy and we're gonna switch gears now. That's just your little food for thought, best practices meal. Enjoy that. And uh, we look forward to your questions about it. What we're gonna do next is find out what's on your mind. So just a quick reminder, we'll go through this again quickly for anyone new joining us. Um, if you already joined, you don't have to rejoin. Uh, you should be logged in, but if you got disconnected, again, you can send a text to 22333. You send the message Dover Cole 516. Uh, and you'll be able to send text answers to the questions we're gonna pull up here in just a minute. So when you do it successfully, you'll see that confirmation box should pop up um, and then uh, you'll be able to send answers. So this uh, number will stay at the top of the slide if you didn't get that. Um, and I'm gonna stop sharing and at least let you bring up uh, the next set of questions. Awesome, and if you have any technical difficulties, you can um, chat us or um, just let somebody know and we'll do our best to help. We'd also like to see your questions and suggestions start to come in via the Q and A button. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, so um, like Amy said, the instructions are also at the top of the screen up here. So you just um, type in A, B, C through I, um, whatever you think uh, you feel your answer is. Um, so the first question is, what is most important about the future design of Niagara Falls Boulevard? You can choose up to three responses for this. Um, you can't choose one thing three times, but you can choose three different options. So just send them as separate text messages. That's the easiest way to do it. And since there's three answers, I'll go ahead and give you guys a little bit more time for this. And just one more time while um, the answers are coming in, if you um, got disconnected, uh, you need to send the, mes the message that you write is Dover Cole 516 and you send it to the number 22333. So it's right here at the top of the screen if you need to get logged in. Amy, um, if um, Sharon's got a good question, we went through that pretty quickly. If you could just uh, slowly uh, describe one more time 
the method for logging in via the cell phone using text messaging. And yeah. uh, Sharon, as Amy goes through this, look at the very top of your screen and she'll explain. So go to your text messaging uh, and you want to send the message that you send is Dover Cole 516. D O V E R K O H L 516. It's all one word. You can do it uppercase or lowercase, that doesn't matter. Uh, but it's Dover Cole 516. And that's the message. And you send that message to the number 22333. Now, Amy, um, uh, questions like this, uh, uh, what are the other ways that people will be asked over you know, the course of the project, uh, some of these kinds of questions? So I mentioned earlier that there is uh, the website, connecting WPRV, uh, I'm sorry, connecting WRPRPV.com. <laughs> we'll Do it one more time. Do it one more time. Connecting WRPV, it stands for Willow Ridge Park View. So if you don't remember, um, but so connecting Willow Ridge Park View, connecting WRPV.com. Um, we'll pull that up on a slide at the end uh, if you want to um, write that down. But um, we'll have a survey up online after this meeting um, between now and the Charette Week. Uh, we're going to be asking many of the same questions that we asked tonight. So people who didn't join us but watched the recording can give their answers there. But there's some additional questions there. We get into more detail. So if you um, even if you answered these questions live tonight, you can still go there and, and fill out the survey. That's helpful to us. I think the, the live answers tonight were just, you know, it's really interesting for us to see for the people who joined us, uh, kind of who was in the room and um, and there, get the quick snapshot of their thoughts, but also take a few minutes afterwards to go to the survey. Awesome. So it looks like just about answers are done coming in. So I'm going to go ahead to the next one. It's interesting. Safe crossings was um, big priority. Pretty much in the big lead. Amy. Mm -hmm. um, Molly, uh, tapped us a note to remind us that that survey you described is now live. It's, you know, connecting wrpv.com forward slash public dash survey. You'll find it easily at connecting wrpv.com. So the survey is already live. And so if you are having any technical difficulties with this uh, text messaging approach to answering the questions, don't fret. There's plenty of ways for you to get your, your feedback to us. And so I'm going to go ahead and read this question. Um, what is your primary interest slash top priority to be included in the action plan? A, redesign Niagara Falls Boulevard. B, improve neighborhood regional parks. C, connect trail ne trails network. D, economic development slash expand commercial businesses. E, enhance neighborhood design. F, more housing choices. Or G, other. And so for this one, you can only answer one because it's your primary, your top priority. Wow, there's a very big consensus on this one. I'm surprised. For our town supervisors and uh, council member Buckeye and others, uh, I'll remind you that. When we do this with 60 or 70 people who log in uh, or 50 people who come to a, a meeting like this, we're not getting answers from a statistically valid scientific poll of the electorate. Uh, we're getting answers from a self-selected group that uh, cares enough to give up some time here on a weeknight, on school night, and, uh, and give us ideas about this. But I think it helps us understand who's meeting with us early on and what kinds of things we want to go investigate more deeply in the first days of the planning effort. So uh, it's all maybe it is a good statistically valid sample of one thing, and that is uh, of the sorts of folks who are likely to come to hearings later on to uh, weigh in on whether your your town boards should adopt policies or plans or budgets or uh, zoning changes or what have you that uh, flow from this planning work. So hopefully all the folks who are contributing tonight by sending in cell phone messages will also be there uh, in uh, those future uh, official meetings months from now when there's the plan in draft form and it's waiting for the elected folks to act on it. 
Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Um, we have about nine more questions, just to let everyone know. Um, so for this one is, how often do you drive along the boulevard? A, daily, B, weekly, C, special events, or D, never? Since busy was one of the words to describe the area, I think it's pretty interesting that daily is also winning as well. Okay, I'm gonna give it a couple more seconds and then we're gonna go ahead to the next one. Looks like everyone's getting their answers in. Okay, go ahead to the next one. How often do you travel along the boulevard by bus? A, daily, B, weekly, C, special events, or D, never? Supervisors, we've got a new question in the Q&A button that's addressed to you. Also, I, I believe we noted that Councilman Carl Zarek had joined us. Did we miss anyone else? Joe, Brian? I don't think so. I don't think anybody else is, any other council members are on, just Carl and myself. Okay. From Tonawanda. So I saw um, Deputy Supervisor Berger uh, at one point. I don't know if she's still in. And uh, and uh, I, I believe uh, Supervisor Eminger that uh, Councilwoman uh, Santa Maria might be on as well on your side now. And I know you were having a harder time seeing the. I, I, the yeah, I, I, I am having a hard time seeing who the participants are for some reason. So uh, thank you, Brian. Looking out for you, Gina. Okay, so the next question is, would you ride the bus more often if A, it was safer slash easier to walk or bike to and from bus stops, B, there was more frequent bus service, C, the bus stops provided shelter, D, there were more routes slash destinations in town to travel to by bus. E, there was an incentive to take the bus like an express lane. Or F, none of the above. So I know this one has kind of a lot of answer choices. So I'm going to give it a little bit more time just so everyone can read through. Okay, it looks like answers have almost finished coming in. So I'm just going to give it a little bit more time. Okay, so we have um, six more questions. Um, how often do you walk in the study area? A, daily, B, weekly, C, special events, or D, never?
Okay, very close on this one. Looks like we have a lot of dedicated pedestrians. Yeah. Awesome, okay, so it looks like the answers have just about finished coming in. So I'm gonna go ahead to the next question. So this one is, how often do you bike in the study area? Again, the choices are A, daily, B, weekly, C, special events, or D, never. And this means any part of the study area, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, through the neighborhoods, maybe you bark, bike through your, um, through Parkview or Willow Ridge. It doesn't just have to be along the boulevard. Okay, interesting. All right, so it looks like the answers have just about finished coming in. I'm gonna just give it a couple more seconds before we switch over. Okay. So this one is, would you walk or bike more frequently if there was safer slash improved on street accommodations? So wider sidewalks, crosswalks, potentially bike lanes, um, different things like that. Uh, a is yes, no is B, C is not sure. So for these answers, these are the types of things we can discuss during the charrette, exactly what this would mean and what's needed. Um, but we're, kind of, we're just curious um, to first ask the question if, you know, these types of solutions are uh, interesting to the folks who are here tonight. Okay, perfect. So lots of potential walkers and bikers. So this question is, how often do you go to a park in the study area? A, daily, B, weekly, C, special events, D, never. Okay. And so there are a couple different parks within the study area. So just any park. Interesting. Okay, so I'm gonna give it just a little bit more time and then we're gonna move on to the next one. We have about three questions left. Okay. So this one is, would you go to a park in the study area more often if A, the park was easier to walk to slash bike to, B, the park had more slash different recreation facilities. C, the park had better connected walking or biking trails. D, the park had more programming or special events. Um, or E, other. So kind of what's more important to you um, to have in your parks? It's interesting. These are all getting a good number of responses. So I think all important is one of the takeaways <laughs> from this question. Mm -hmm. 
I am curious for anyone who's answering other, if you want to um, put something up in the chat or the um, questions and answer of other things that would uh, make it so that you would want to go to a park more often. We're curious to know what that is. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to go to the next question. So this is a short answer question. So you can type in whatever you prefer. Um, which ideas discussed tonight were most exciting to you? And you can just type in a short, brief answer. The anticipation is thrilling. <laughs> Well, this is what happens when it's not just one word. Mm -hmm. Oh, we got one person who said everything. That okay. was the nice answer. Thank you for your encouragement. Transforming the boulevard, okay. Mm -hmm. Park and trail connections. Once again, the boulevard. Amy, to, uh, in response to your question about what would make you more likely to go to the park that falls into the other category, Steve Steinberg says more fishing spots uh, would make a difference to him. Well, we're really seeing some recurring themes here, connectedness, uh, safety, greenness, uh, tree-lined streets, green spaces, um, safety for folks walking and biking, accessibility. Multimodal focus. That must we have a traffic engineer in the room. <laughs> the, the word multimodal, uh, for those who don't recognize it, means thinking about all the modes of moving around, um, including driving, um, but um, walking, biking, and transit are sometimes called by transportation engineers alternate modes of travel. And we always uh, interrupt and say, "Whoa, hold on a minute! Walking is not an alternate mode; it's the original mode." Um, so, multimodal focus. There's some applause here for the decision by the two towns to work together on this effort. It happens. It doesn't happen every day. It's not the sort of thing that happens in every, in every region. But it's great to see here. A lot about trail connectivity. Sorry Snow. about that. Snow. Low stress environment. Okay, so I'll I'm curious, uh, Joe and Brian, uh, supervisors, have you seen anything on this list you were not expecting to see? Any surprises or affirmations you're, you take from what you just saw your, your friends and neighbors and constituents type in? I, I think that. Um, you know, you, this this doesn't come up easy, right? I mean, um, between Jim Hartz and, and Tonawanda and Kim Appleman and our planning department here, um, you know, they're, they've been focused on figuring out ways to make both communities better. And, uh, you know, Joe and I, we recognize that we've been a little limited in this corridor by the fact that it's a state-controlled right-of-way and... Um, I, again, I won't put words in my fellow supervisor's mouth, but, you know, if we're going to see change happen, then, you know, we need to be catalysts of change. Joe, you want to? 
the, um, the, the, the answers that are given here uh, tonight that I've seen, uh, really, really not a surprise. What I think it proves is that we face a lot of challenges along the boulevard. You know, there, there are a wide variety of, uh, of answers that people are, are, are giving and have given thought to, and uh, there's no easy solution. And that's why it's even more important for uh, town of Amherst, uh, Brian, myself, the town board, town of Wanda. Uh, we got to, you know, continue the dialogue. And as Brian says, we 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 got to work for to make it happen. And that's uh, that's what we that's what we've started a few years ago, and that's what we're continuing tonight, and we'll be going forward. Awesome. So it looks like we're about done getting answers. So I'm going to go to our last question. So are there any key issues not discussed tonight that you would like the planning team to study during the shred? And for folks who joined late and didn't hear the definition, uh, shred is a fancy French word meaning working together under uh, under tight time pressure to, uh, as a community, to pull together a plan. So we're going to have a community planning charrette in early April, um, which Amy will give you a reminder about the details of momentarily. And, and in that event, you'll have a chance to come touch the plan, look over our shoulders as we're working, work together over maps with your neighbors and uh, help fulfill the idea that the best plan is made by many hands. So that's what I mean by Chirac. So uh, your list here is uh, our homework list to get ready for that. Amy, uh, you wanna fill in the details about the upcoming Chirac? Yes, just uh, mark your calendars for um, April 2nd through the 7th. Uh, there's um, many different ways to get involved. Um, there's uh, big community meetings, there's a bus tour, um, there's a design studio where you can stop by and, and get up to speed. So all those details are, are outlined on the website. You can go to connectingwrpv.com. So connecting Willow Ridge Park View. Uh, so connectingwrpv.com um, and get all of the, the details about the, the charrette and the dates again, April 2nd, uh, Saturday, April 2nd through Thursday, April 7th. And like Victor said, this list here is a great um, resource to us to know about things that are on your mind. Maybe if you had something uh, you wanted to talk about tonight um, that we didn't mention in the presentation, but we should be you know, thinking about and, and address during the short week, uh, it'd be great to, great to know about it. So uh, anything that comes to mind that um, you think is important to the future of these neighborhoods and to the boulevard. Kim, there's a question here about communication to the schools. Um, I don't know if you want to handle that one and talk about what we have planned as far as outreach over the next couple of weeks to let people know about uh, the events coming up. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think uh, Supervisor Culpa actually answered a question about the school um, involvement, and I saw that uh, he's not on currently, but I believe the the uh, principal of Willow Edge Elementary was actually on the call. <clears throat> So we've been working with Sweet Home School District, and as you can tell from Amy's discussion, we're going to be having some events at their um, at their events as well. They have an indoor carnival coming up next week, where we'll um, sort of introduce the project again to anybody who's interested and um, to uh, encourage them to come during the Shred Week. So the school will be involved for sure during during the project. Awesome, so it looks like we're just getting in a few more answers. Um, Amy, if you would like, we can also, um, I can leave this open while you um, tell them about the website and the rest of our upcoming events. So I'm just gonna pull up here um, again, so you can see it here written down. So there's that website, connectingwrpv.com. So go ahead and write that down. It's a brand new website. Um, so just launched last week. 
Uh, and you can get all the details about the Charette events. Um, that's where you can register for any of the online Zoom meetings. Uh, you can register to um, get links. And there's also uh, you know, more details about each of the events and the schedule. Um, and so, uh, and also the survey. The survey actually went live today. So, um, so there, all, all the questions we asked tonight are there. Um, so if uh, you, but uh, there's also additional questions. So if you want to um, go and, and take the survey online and encourage all of your friends and neighbors to, to take it as well. Um, and uh, it, it has goes into just a little bit more detail than we did tonight. But I want to um, thank everyone um, tonight for, for coming out and spending some time with us and, and giving us your thoughts. And I'll turn it over to uh, the supervisors if they have any last words. I'll go first. Brian's spoken first uh, the, the, the whole night, so I'll, I'll beat him to the punch. And uh, so uh, I just want to thank uh, uh, Dover Cole for, for uh, putting this on tonight. I uh, especially want to thank uh, the residents on both sides of the uh, of the boulevard. I, uh, I think what was presented tonight is a lot of thought provoking uh, issues that we got to address. And uh, uh, not gonna, like I said earlier, it's, I don't think it's going to be an easy fix, but uh, it's it's nothing that if we work together, it's nothing that uh, we can't accomplish together. So uh, uh, I'm really excited about uh, what we have started here, and uh, I look forward to, to go the charrettes and, and going forward, and uh, you know meeting more people and getting input from the public because you know they're the people who are around this call for the most part are the ones that live in those neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, they, uh, they need to be heard and, uh, and they will be heard. This is their opportunity to speak up uh, uh, at this time. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Mr. Culpa, supervisor. So I'll just say um, that on behalf of myself and uh, my board, um, you know, we're excited to be uh, able to, to proceed into this project. It would not be possible if we didn't have uh, partners on the other side of the boulevard. So I'd like to thank um, the town of Tonawanda supervisor and the board um, for, you know, uh, for working with us through this. Um, ultimately, um, I'm excited. I think this is uh, uh, an area that, um, you know, I've, I've long looked at and said, hey, I want to, I want to see uh, how communities can push for change. And uh, this is a great opportunity to take that next step. So thank you again to our peers in Tonawanda and thank you to all the residents and all the participants um, from both sides of the boulevard tonight. All right, just thank you from the Dover Cole team and we're looking forward to seeing everyone in a few weeks. Uh, so thank you everyone for your participation. Good night.